Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin O'Neill. I'm one of the elected council members with Slayout of Nation. I send regrets from Chief Jen Thomas, Councillors De Deanna George, Leanna Martin, Dennis Thomas, and Curtis Thomas. Um, first, I want to welcome you all to Slayout of Nation. We have been here since time immemorial. One thing about Slayout of is we always like to uplift all of our members because everyone has their own gift and we want to make sure that they uh, you utilize those gifts and um, as elected leaders we um, di direct our staff to not just support our members but also support those around our community such as SFU where we have um, where we have cur where we're, we were currently working on building a stronger relationship and tonight we also have Councillor Charlene Alec here, who is going to be um, working alongside with Ruben George and um, Professor Winona Williams on the transformation and other Indigenous governance principles. At this time, I'll actually invite our drummers back up to sing another song. Um, hello everyone, my name is Joy Johnson and I want to just begin by thanking um, the nation for welcoming us here today. Um, as was mentioned, we are um, building a strong relationship with the Suela Tooth Nation and um, just as a token of appreciation, I want to present you with this picture which uh, was taken when we signed our MOU together. It really meant that was a fantastic day for SFU and we are so very grateful. So thank you ever so much. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of Slayer Foundation, uh, we want to give you this. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. That's very, very nice. Thank yeah. you so much. Deeply appreciate yeah. it. Thank nice you. Job. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, wonderful. Um, we are going to start this evening. Um, as I said, my name is Joy Johnson. It's my pleasure to be the president of Simon Fraser University. Uh, this is a beautiful building, and I want to begin by thanking. Um, the drummers uh, and singers for this evening for starting us off in a good way. Um, and I do also want to acknowledge um, the land that we're on, the unceded um, uh, traditional territory of the Suela Nation. This is my first time in this building and I'm absolutely in awe. It is absolutely beautiful and just such a warm and welcoming feeling here. We are joined by many members of the community here and I'm just really pleased that you could join us but there are close to 700 people who signed up online as well. So while it feels small and cozy here, we've got many, many people joining us online. And I wanna welcome all of you as well to the president's um, um, uh, faculty lecture. This is an event that's hosted by uh, uh, SFU Public Square, and we feature members of our faculty. 
And tonight, it is indeed our honor to uh, feature a scholar, an amazing scholar, Dr. Winona Hall, who's an associate professor and chair of Indigenous Studies Department at Simon Fraser University. And she's gonna be sharing findings from her PhD research on Indigenous governance uh, and what it looks like within a colonial system. Um, we're also met, welcoming uh, a number of community members from Swellative Nation um, as well to share their experiences. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation that we're gonna be having. Um, so I do have a little bit of housekeeping. It's my job to do the housekeeping before we um, invite Winona to do her presentation. For those of you who are joining on Zoom, um, you can have closed captioning. Uh, there's a button at the bottom, CC. And um, you can, um, uh, if you need that assistance, that's there for you. Um, we've closed the chat for this evening, um, so, but if you have any problems, please feel free to message the hosts and panelists online. Um, we're gonna have a Q and A. And so for those of you um, online, um, there is op an opportunity for you to post questions online and um, also in the room this evening as well. We'll be opening it up for questions as well. We have guidelines for the way we have our discussions. We wanna be respectful of one another. And um, those guidelines for those of you online are posted in the chat. So I wanna get us on with the main show for this evening and that is to invite this amazing um, our, uh, faculty member, Winona Hall. Um, Winona is a Stolo scholar and a member of the Squawkale First Nation um, and the Chewayak che tribe. She's an associate press professor and the chair of Indigenous Studies Department at Simon Fraser University. Dr. Hall is a mother to three adult children. I've met one. Um, her three children are Jade, Justice, and, um, and Alex and is the oldest uh, granddaughter of Gordon and Blossom Hall. And her parents are Bob Hall Sr. and Donna Kickbush. So wonderful to have you here. Before I welcome you though, I also want to introduce our community members who are gonna be joining us this evening as well. Um, we're gonna be joined this evening um, by Charlene Alec, a member of the Suelatith Nation. Um, and she's also from Chiam. Uh, she's currently serving her fourth term as a counselor of the Suelatith First Nation. She's a mother of four and a grandmother. Her late parents are Joe and Irene Alec, and her maternal grandparents are Chief Dan George and Amy George. Her parental grandparents are Fred Cheer and Cecilia Thomas. Charlene is also an actress, and you may have recognized her from her role in the CBC TV series, The Beachcombers. Um, we are also joined by Reuben George this evening, again, a member of the Suelatith Nation, uh, an internationally known activist and Sundance chief. He's the son of Amy George and Terry Baker, and his maternal grandparents are Chief Dan George and Amy George, and Reuben, Reuben is the author of the best-selling memoir, It Stops Here, Standing Up for Our Lands, Our Water, and Our People, and it was recently published in 2023, and I'm jealously looking at copies of that book sitting right there. So congratulations on that amazing um, publication as well. So thank you all for being here this evening. It's absolute delight to be here. And with no further ado, I'll invite Winona to provide our her presentation to us. Over to you, Winona. Please join me in welcoming her. Aislat Siaya Siam Silialakwa Silialakwa Sequalamot Shwalmukluk Squi Casta Quiquilstom Tal Squi Talitsaqua Squaquail Casta Sawayak Eta Squalawal Letzamon to be with you this evening in Sale Watul. In my less than adequate grasp of my own language, Halkamalam, I am saying good evening, my dear loved ones, our respected leaders, our old people, and all of our ancestors. I'm sharing with you my ancestral name, Sokwalamat, which comes from my great, great, great grandmother, and my gifted name from the Stalo people, Kwikwilstam. I'm sharing that I am a member of the Skalkel First Nation, and the tribe from which Chilliwack derives its name, the Sawayak. And I'm sharing with you that I have such good feeling and I am of one heart and one mind to be with my Sawayla Tuf relatives tonight. This is different from when I practiced at home. 
I was gifted the name Quequel Stom 26 years ago, an honor I share with Joe Alec, Charlene's father, and also with my son, Justice Victor. It is the closest way in Halkamalem to describe justice, the full saying being Quequel Stom Quilam A. This name teaches me to do my best to live in balance, to be sharing, caring, and kind, and to always remember they are teaching you, moving you toward the good. They being our Sealyalakwath, our ancestors, and our Sealyalakwath, our old people. And if that isn't a big enough responsibility, nine years ago I received my ancestral name, Sequalamot. This name comes from my paternal grandfather's great, great, great grandmother, so my Tomioch. My ancestral name carries the responsibility to always speak my truth and to stand on my own two feet. I carry this honor and this responsibility of carrying these two names in everything I do, from parenting, teaching, chairing a university department, to addressing the multiple levels and forms of racism we experience on a daily basis. And sometimes these, contra sorry, and sometimes these responsibilities contradict themselves. In that sometimes when I speak my truth, our truth, I put things out of balance but I've come to accept that this is okay and even necessary as dismantling colonialism in all its various forms is good work. I am the eldest daughter of Donna Kickbush, probably the whitest settler I've ever met, and Bob Hall Sr. Stallo, probably the reddest man I've ever met. He used to make me bring fish guts back to the river and he was a member of the Red Power Movement. How they met and married is an interesting squall call for another time. I am also the eldest daughter, granddaughter of Blossom Lee, a Chinese immigrant to Jamaica, and Gordon Hall Sr., whose lineage traces me back to the beginning of time for the Soweit people. How my grandfather met and fell in love with my Chinese grandmother in Jamaica is yet another Hall Squalqual for another time, and probably the best love story ever, if you ask me. Tonight, I am honored to be given this space to share some of what I have come to understand so far in relation to Indigenous governance. And what I mean is governance according to our Indigenous worldviews, principles, and ways of being and knowing, not colonial governance enacted by Indigenous peoples. I hope this distinction is evident. While I've been taught by some of the best of the best in this area, any mistakes I make or any misunderstandings are mine and mine alone and not a reflection of any of my teachers. Here are some of the old people I have had the honor of learning from, and this is um, by no means an exhaustive list. Sorry. I saw the paper shuffling. Because even with my glasses, I don't know if I can read that. My apologies. Um, Rudy Leon from Stahelis First Nation. Ivan McIntyre from Seabird Island First Nation. Leonard George from here, Sawela Tooth. Eugene Harry of Cowichan Tribes residing in Squamish Nation. Amy Victor, my am, our auntie, Amy Victor, my auntie, Amy Victor, from Cowichan Tribes, but we claim her now in Palalp Territory. Siama Laluch, Joe Alec from Chiam First Nation. Terry Prest, residing in Sewali First Nation. Yamalot, Rosaline George from Squaw. Elizabeth Hurling from Seabird Island. Tikwala Atsa, my uncle Herb Joe from Chiacton. Rini Green from Skalkail. Mary Uslick from Skalkail. We Alamot. Tilly Gutierrez from Chihuahua. Kwam Kwam Iam, Dr. Joanne Archibald from Suwali. Tim Kathlamot, my daughter, Jade Victor, who came with me this evening. She's from Skalkale, Chiam, and Stahelis. We need to see if her grandma gets a react. Yeah, there's a smile. <laughs> Iowa, Margaret Commodore from Suwali. Joe Hall from Chiacton. Dr. Dave Sheppy, our settler archeologist. Walelik, Ken Malloway from Yakakuyas, Otis Jasper, Suwali First Nation, Siolia, June Quip, 
from Chiam First Nation, Ovid Mercury, Cree from Grand Rapids, Manitoba. And how he landed on this list is a very interesting story that I'll save for another time. Corky Douglas from Chiam, Tom Sanson, Sinchothan, and Quetzaltatl, Patricia Kelly from the Camel First Nation. So that's, of course, not an exhaustive list of the people who have taught me over the many years, but certainly the ones have, that have invested a lot of time in teaching me and helping me. Tonight, I am joined by Charlene Alec and Ruben George. When I was first asked to be a part of the President's Faculty Lecture Series, I froze and it was an instant hard no. But when I was told I could do it in community, I felt more at ease, not just because my research is community driven and belongs in community, but also because I realized now that I am teaching at Simon Fraser University, I could reconnect with my downriver relatives. This is important to me as Leonard and Irene George, both from here, and Joe Alec, Irene's husband from Chiam, were seminal to my research. So I approached Charlene last December about hosting us, or I think I might have just said me and left out the part about the SFU president. <laughs> we didn't need that kind of stress at the moment. <laughs> and asked if she would be interested in hosting us. She accepted and let me know that she would be voluntolling two of her brothers one of which walked by that day, it was Justin, happened to walk by that day we were meeting, um, but he is out of town. And she said, not to worry, I'll get um, Reuben and Gabe to join us. And I said, well, will they? And she says, oh yeah, if I tell them. <laughs> and sure enough, <laughs> it happens that way. And I hope you don't mind, but I crept your Facebook pages. I hope that's okay. Unfortunately, Gabe is not able to be with us this evening. He's tending to some family responsibilities. Um, so I did tell him, well, I'm gonna talk about you a bit. And so what I wanna share is that while he is a gifted orator, I'm sure if you've ever heard him speak, he's also a gifted selfie taker. <laughs> oh. So here we are. And I can honestly tell you, I've never been more nervous to give a presentation in my life. And trust me, I've given a few. When I began my research studies, Indigenous research methodologies were just beginning to make their way into the academic arena via such Indigenous scholars as Linda Smith, Sean Wilson, Margaret Kovac, Kathleen Absalon, among others. I quickly and happily switched my indig indigenized qualitative method to an Indigenous research method. This meant I could focus exclusively on Indigenous ways of knowing and ground my research in Indigenous theoretical understandings. To help with this process, I decided to use weaving as a metaphor to guide my journey. I weave, sorry, weaving is a coveted skill among the Huamuk people. And though I do not weave with wool, I weave with words. So just as a swathwith, an example of which my son Alexis Victor is wearing in the top left corner, tells the history, location, status, and relationships of a family, so too would my dissertation. Abiding by an Indigenous research methodology meant I could learn from soft tamach, from our land, from our world, from shwokhiam, from our ancient stories, from silialakwa, our ancestors, from silialakwa, our old people, and from halkamelam, the upriver dialect of our language. I completely immersed myself in my wool gathering phase. My research went with me everywhere I went and in everything I did, I lived my research. I was a living, walking, breathing, sleeping, human form of data analysis software. <laughs> in so doing, I could ensure my findings would be relevant, reliable, credible, and meaningful to the Homach people. Not to mention, like most indigenous people, I have trust issues and didn't trust computers or data software to treat my sources, let alone my findings, with the proper respect and thoroughness required. Coming out of my immersion required yet another form of transformation, but was worth it. 
So what did I learn? Through the travels of Chachals, our transformers, I learned about the power of place. As stated by a Gitzan elder, if this is your land, where are your stories? And if anybody happens to know the name of that Gitzan elder, I would love to collect it. I've lurked and looked and looked and can't find it, but he's definitely speaking our language. Through the transformation of Heathlake and her Shwokwiam, I learned about the importance of women to the well-being and to the governance of the people. Through my reconnection with my ancestor Tikwalatsa, especially Stone Tikwalatsa, I learned from Sawayath, the laws of our ancestors, our teachings. I learned that we must learn how to resolve conflict in a good way, that relationships are paramount. Relationships to self, to territory, to family, and relationships with Sawayath are vital, that transformations are not only necessary, they are inevitable. I learned that our title to our territories are embedded in our ancestral names and in our shwukwiam, for example, Kokolitsa, and that they predate colonialism by hundreds and sometimes thousands of years. I learned that good governance requires good leadership, and some of the qualities of a good leader are they know who they are, they are spiritual, they are meaningfully connected to territory, they are ayahloet, which in our language means they are doing the best that they can, they are standing on their two, own two feet. It was the closest word I could find to self-determination and self-determining. And I'm just going to slip in a quick story here that when I went to the elders and asked them, how do we say self-determination in Halkamalam, they asked me to leave their breakfast meeting. <laughs> so, but luckily I came across the, um, from Brent Galloway who collected uh, a lot of our language, I came across I offer it, which spoke to exactly what I was trying to get at in terms of doing the best that you can and standing on your own two feet. They are respected and they can achieve let samat, which is to be of one heart and one mind, and they can achieve that both as an individual, but also collectively. And they are good listeners. I think to our Indigenous world, I'm probably stating the obvious about what a good siam is and what a respected leader brings to the table. But when we apply this to colonial governing structures, maybe not so much. I learned that our governing structures won't be found here. No matter how hard we look or how many delegations we send or how many leaders we send, we won't find them here because they're here. And our governing structures are here. And in our sacred ceremonies, like Sowetan, our one of, sorry, we have four sacred ceremonies, one of which has been gifted to every single Huamuk family as an honor, a responsibility they carry for the people. They can be used to celebrate, to mourn, to signify a change, a transformation in our life progress. Governing structures are found in our burning ceremonies that let us communicate with our loved ones that have passed. And during our winter dance ceremonies, our mithla, when our painted relatives share their medicine to keep us strong during the long winter months when energy can be low due to the lack of sun and connection to the dirt, to Mother Earth. And last, but certainly not least, our ceremonies are our ceremonies to pass ancestral names, distinguished from gifted and pet names, equally important, but di different in terms of governing structures. When we look for our laws, or our governing principles, we won't find them here. But we will find them here in our oral histories, traditions, and stories, these being just a select few that taught me about governing principles. And here in our transformation sites, such as in our transfer transformation story of Hithlake, and her sisters.
And here I will share a few of our governing principles that have been written down, as I believe that when in Rome, do as the Romans do, meaning that if you're going to live here and call this land your home, then you need to live by these principles as well. As I read them out, just think how different our world would be if everyone now living in our territory abided by these laws. It is good to remember the teachings of our ancestors. Respect all things. Don't waste, ruin, destroy anything. Only take what you need. This is our land. We have to take care of everything that belongs to us. I am still in process of learning the proper Halkamelam pronunciation for these laws. The last one I'm going to say is Soth Tomuk to Equala, Kwamuk to Mukstam to Equala. I am close to saying it correctly, thanks to Sunny McKelsey, who repeats this one and repeats this one, and I hope he never stops repeating it. When we look to our language, we don't have a word for resources. As Elder Joe Alec taught us, we have a word and it's shwahomis, which means gifts from our ancestors. If you look to our language, you see that what we now call resources, such as lands, trees, waters, minerals, fish, animals, etc., are actually our relatives. And when something is related to you, you treat it very differently than if there were no connection to you whatsoever. <clears throat> 24 years ago, I sat with Leonard George and my daughter Jade happened to be with me. So it's, it just feels like I've come full circle. He encouraged me to learn to write so we could write our own laws, laws that respect all things, adhere to our teachings, our laws, laws that will ensure our tomiak, our future and our past generations are well cared for. He used the metaphor of a stew, encouraging us to make our own stew that adheres to our ways of knowing and being. He said to me, and I quote, why do you want to take something that doesn't work? and put it into your own stew, chicken that has been fast-tracked, vegetables grown with pesticides. When we can grow a whole new garden based on our own values and systems of being. So as we learn or relearn how to govern ourselves, as we learn to remember ourselves and write our own contemporary laws, I like to check to see if it's a part of our governing circle. Is it a part of our new, new stew? Or is it a part of the colonial regime, that old stew that makes us sick and gives us no energy? If it is a part of our governing circle, it will protect our territory. There will be ancestral names that tie us to this territory. There will be Shwokwiam that teaches us how to connect and respect the territory. Our grandmothers, our matriarchs will agree. We will be doing the best that we can, standing on our own two feet. We will be abiding by the teachings and laws of our ancestors. We will be caring for our sacred gifts, our trees, our water, our land, our air, our fire, our language, and our children. Our respected leaders will agree, and we will be practicing our family gift and our individual gift and sharing it with the people. So let's take these teachings that have been so carefully laid out for us and make our own stew, as Leonard would say, or the updated version, as my daughter would say. Let's return to our own laws and live by our own governing principles that have worked for us since the beginning of time. There's nothing holding us back anymore except ourselves. Lahai, that's the end of my um, presentation. Wasn't that fantastic? Let's uh, give Winona a hand for that absolutely amazing presentation. I think I have fun. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And there's so much to pick up in the conversation. Um, so um, I'm going to maybe get us started and just wondering, Ruben, Charlene, one of you, I'd like to hear from both of you any thoughts or ideas that you'd like to just start out with in terms of responding to what you've heard. Check. Yeah, she's still bossing them around. <laughs> That's great. 
<laughs> we are a matriarchal community. <clears throat> I, I worked with Uncle Ed on something similar, you know, for our department, Sacred Trust, looking at the pipeline. We, um, a couple things I want to say that hit me, but, but um, we did a 1200 page assessment, a spill analysis, a clean analysis. We did multiple economic studies. We did, we didn't still do air quality tests all on about one thing. And it was based out of Tisleweteth Nation law. And um, that, was, that was important. And, and we started to work on what we wanted to do is put the same effort into every department economic development, housing, education, and, and create a system that comes from the same place. Because mm. at the opposite end, what we're dealing with, the government does the same thing. When we presented uh, 13 years ago, 12 years ago, the National Energy Board, um, with all our information that we gathered, they said, yeah, we'll, we'll give you 45 minutes to explain years and decades of work. and." Um, it was a joke, and but it, it, it's like that with every level of government, whether it's dealing with the Ministry of Children and Families, whether it's the Murder of Missing Women Inquiry. Like they asked me to MC it when it came to British Columbia, and it was really good. They listened to the stories of the victims, but the inquiry should have been on the police, the judges, the coroners, and all that, and, mm. and it wasn't. And so, just saying that where we come from is, is our law. Like you can say, Kosielish law, truth, family, health, culture. Then those fundamental beliefs of almost any religious and spiritual belief, love, honor, respect, dignity, pride, compassion, understanding, truth, knowledge, wisdom, courage, and bravery. That's how we're supposed to raise our kids from. But the colonial system wrecked havoc. Like Slewatith, we were 17, 20,000 people. My mom remembers it went down to 13. It's almost completely extinct. And, and what came with that was wounds. But oh, I'm so proud of that. What they're able to hold on to is enough culture to still to build us up to where we are today. And what we included and what we had and what I see with and part of our law and what I see you, you write is, is the language, the songs, being on the land, those all breed spirit. Like trauma breeds spirit too. Because, you know, when we see or witness or feel trauma, just like love, two people come together and form a spirit of love, there's a spirit of trauma that could be created. And that, that was hampering our people. And so we use those tools that our ancestors used, and that was the songs, that was the language, that was the land, that was the water, to build ourselves up again and help us to remember the teachings that governed our, our people for th thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So now we're at a place where we could do that. But we look at the opposite end, where the murder and missing woman query or, or, or the National Energy Board giving us 45 minutes to do a presentation where we're opposing, it's the, they're the opposite. Mm -hmm. And I remember when we started that fight against the TMX and the elders are like, well, okay, how do we do this? And they're like, well, you, you, you show them our way and you use our way. And I was thinking, our way of spirit, how could we show them our way of spirit and explain it to people who don't even understand they carry spirit with inside of themselves? Mm. And we, the decisions we make are, are based on our reciprocal relationship of spirit mm. because of their language. When we see our name, it's not just saying our name. It's projected into the spiritual realm. When, the, when my brother is singing that song, that song's anchored here on earth in this physical realm. And it creates a path into the spiritual realm and we could we could we could send send our trauma or send a prayer or do whatever we need and our fires are anchored here but the smoke goes into the spiritual realm that's where our ancestors are and that's where the wisdom is and it's not just that we're sending prayers up there our hurt and pain going up there we're asking for things to come back mm -hmm. and those things that come back are the lessons that we forgot and when we practice what we need to practice our language, our ceremony, our songs, those messages do come back. So what we're standing up against is, is a government that don't care. They don't. It's a, it's a sad thing to see the snow pact is the second lowest it's ever been. 
That means it's going to dry out some rivers. That means it's going to kill some salmon. 500 species rely on the salmon. Flowers, trees, birds, bears, everything. They rely on it, and that's in jeopardy. And we're listening to a government that says, hey, we're okay. What are they, this pipeline cost $33 billion over budget, but we're still going to use it. When that money could go to 300 hydrogen plants and get us off of fossil fuels and put us onto something that no pollution comes out of it. It's water that comes out of running a hydrogen engine. <laughs> that technology is there, but we still make th these choices that are dysfunctional with a government that is dysfunctional. And the, the sad thing is the people listen, even though it's, it's, it used to be not in our backyard. Don't worry about it. It's not in our backyard, but it is now. Mm -hmm. It's in everybody's backyard. We all need to do something, but I'm going to ramble on, so I better stop here. <laughs> wow, thank you so much for your presentation. And um, I like everything that you uh, went over and said, because those are a lot of the things that I say um, as well. Um, when I speak to organizations within the territory, I do say that. I say, well, you're an MST territory, which is Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. Um, do as Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people do. Um, and that is abiding by learning the language, abiding by the environment, um, and not trying to overtake anything in that environment. Um, using the language, because the language is from the land. And the land, um, it has a different rhythm. When you use the English language, it's very um, um, commanding. Mm -hmm. Get me that chair, write me, write me that paper, um, go clean those dishes. It's like mm -hmm. um, uh, a commanding language. Whereas with uh, an indigenous language, you move with the actions of what you're doing. Um, collecting cottonwood, all can mean all of that in one word. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean about the rhythm of that language and abiding by that rather than um, using a language that um, has nothing to do with the laws of the land that we're living on. And I like that you brought up the spirit of things, um, Ruben, because um, that too, bringing in our culture and bringing it to places and you know, trying to figure out how we're going to move forward um, as Indigenous peoples into a system that came and broke down everything mm -hmm. that we're trying to hold up. They took all the resources. They spent all the all the um, natural resources um, taken and you know abused the land. And we're trying to go back um, with that spirit back into that place. So I think the more that um, we combine and unite, um, and our elders did this for generations and generations. You'll look back in some of our stories, um, even back to like the 1500s, all the leaders always got together with all of our concerns. What's working? Um, you know, the cranberries are good, when to harvest, um, when to share, when to pull back, you know, make sure that there was enough salmon for, for everyone and not over overfishing. Um, you know, and our leaders had really good um, indication and it was from the land. It wasn't from any of the two leggeds who thought they were in a higher up position in order to overtake and you know, that's the system that we're up against. Um, you know, we say the Western culture has the, the almighty dollar at the top. Well, us indigenous at the top of our period, uh, pyramid is, is um, the environment and everything that lives in it. Mm. So right there, we're already backwards. Mm. Um, you know, and at the bottom of the Western culture is the environment. And so in the bottom of our pyramid is um, how we can make our economies work together, you know, sharing our clams or, you know, um, bartering and trading and making our economies work that way. 
it's two different um, systems and beliefs and how to apply our methodology of living from the land and abiding by the land um, in a system that is totally backwards is going to take a lot of work and i think you know having um an outreach like this and then inviting the people in setting the table because two i say be as an mst in msd territory but we can't give them heck when they don't know what it is how to be an msd so upraising our upholding our laws our indigenous ways of knowing being and um, the way that we walk with it is with all of that care um, that you spoke about in your presentation you know not taking um, uh, or just taking what you need and not um, um, killing off all the fish and not picking all the all the berries and just just um, walking in a way where um, you're thinking of the future generations um, I think I'll just leave leave it at that for now. You know, um, I, I feel like that uh, I, I have so much to learn um, from all of you in that uh, so much of what Winona you talked about in terms of leadership are just really great leadership values as well mm -hmm. that everyone could benefit from. Um, and, and I really liked what you had to say as well about, um, you know, that there is also an opportunity for us to learn about what it means to be on MST territory and, and to, to take those lessons. You know, your your topic was about indigenous governance and colonial structures. And do you, I mean, that's the that's the challenge also that you were talking about is, is there, what's the opportunity um, to think about, is it to just keep indigenous governance separate or is there a way to, uh, you know, for colonial structures to adapt and learn or, you know, what's the, what's the hope for the future in terms of these two, two solitudes. Winona, I don't know what your thinking is about that or yeah, any of you would be fantastic to, to hear more. That's, that's I should have said this, but I'm super happy for you. Oh. And I think it's incredible and I'm super proud of you and I always see what you're doing and awesome representation of, of our of our nation and our people and work so important. So um keep it separate. You know it, it's 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 war nation. Mm -hmm. There's many nations here, and, you know. And, and I think of our longhouse. There, there's no, there's no, um, you know, we do it the way we do it, <laughs> and other nations don't really question it. Yeah. And you know, like with Squamish, Musqueam, or down in the states, and don't really question it. Say, oh, that's that's good. That's that's the way they do it, mm -hmm. and that's their business. And you know, and it, and it, and it, but. And the common things, it's the same. Like right now, we're we're doing a little bit of a religious and spiritual movement to bring awareness to the pipeline. And my grandpa he used to say, it "Doesn't matter if you're Catholic or Christian, Muslim or Longhouse, or as long as you're good at it, mm -hmm. be good at it." And, and what he meant is those fundamentals, what those 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 teachings are based on, are is what I talked about earlier. You know, and so. Um, I, I did a ceremony for 12 priests that came in sweat lodge and we're going to do a ceremony for 12 rabbis and you know they I prayed with them and they, they, I go to their house and pray their way come to my house we'll pray my way and and they're open to it mm. but those fundamental teachings are the same I think the barrier is what what historically if we if we if we look at how we were formed it was based on trauma yeah. Historically, and, and we're 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 living in, 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 on generational pain, and and it, and in our society set up to fix mental, emotional, and physical trauma. But a big trauma is lack of spirit. Yeah. And and I totally see that in in what we're dealing with, and where people come from is from the mind, and and not not from the heart or the spirit. And and that that's hard and that's difficult. And if we could teach a better way, you know. Because in some ways, it, 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 making dysfunctional dis decisions that don't include their future generations. That's what I hope that uh, we continue to do, is make those choices. So if there's something learned from that, like, why not? Yeah. 
why not connect to yourself and love life more or love your partner more or think of these fundamentals and those teachings that we have to to make ourselves a better human being better family member better community member better leader yeah. and 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 the way that i see it what, what what could i learn from from the dysfunctional government that you know services things that don't make sense and, and a lot of it's rich the rich people mm. a lot of it's fossil fuels pharmaceuticals mm. you know it's it's look, look, look what we're giving out to people yeah. <laughs> and and what we're saying is like no no let's 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 try and so what it comes down to because we're saying no what we say is hey canada you're a nation british columbia you're a nation so are we mm. and, and and let's meet and that was the idea behind that governance model we're working on with Uncle N is that no matter how we're going to sit down at the government, it's going to come from those same principles because they come from the same dysfunctional principles. Mm -hmm. And but it works, though. Haidegui just did it. They just did it. And in one way or the other, they're going to get 98% of their land base back. Yeah. That's the whole island almost. They're, they they got give them a a hundred million dollars to start buying back the, the the logging companies and the fishing companies and they say if you want to talk to us no matter what level of government you are these are our principles that we talk from and they agreed they agreed and so can it work yeah and, and 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 that's a success thing so um it it is it is it is separate but we have to find a way to work with each other because we need to at these desperate times for our future generations if i can wish that undrip and dripper was a magic wand and it had the ability to um, give indigenous peoples that voice to not have to go to court to prove that they have a right to live on the land that they're living on. Um, you see so many of our relatives going to the Supreme Court of Canada trying to prove that they don't want this project in their territory and then they have to prove that why they have to go to court to fight that. Mm -hmm. If Un Undrip and Drippa had that magic wand to turn it around and have the government go to that indigenous territory and say, this is why we think we can come into your territory and do this project. Mm -hmm. Turn that table around and give the rights holder to where they rightly belong. Mm -hmm. Until that happens, um, adopting UNDRIP um, is a great thing, but is Canada, is that where it's gonna um, live? I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, they're taking steps and for the general um the general public of canadians you know you you have to want it you have to want that change um so if you're a part of an organization you do want to do right by the land um, there are some glorious stories out there where organizations are adapting some of the qualities and visions of the indigenous people in their territory um, and those are baby steps and those are those are ways to make those changes um, because we can't go back to the people that broke us to ask for help so placing our beliefs and our laws in that place i don't uh, does it have a place it probably could but um they have to want it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, uh, at Simon Fraser University, we've been thinking a lot about what our obligate, I mean, we're a colonial institution, a university, um, and thinking about our obligations um, and the learnings that we can take on to, to think about our responsibilities and our governance um, at the university. And uh, Chris Lewis, who's here with us at Tacton, um, uh, is helping with some of that. But, you know, I'm going to ask maybe a question you'd ask, Chris, and that's really, we're trying to think about 
UNDRIP and our responsibilities within the university structure governance as well about how about indigenous governance within the university and how one might think about that so that our indigenous faculty staff and students can make decisions regarding matters that really affect them within the university think about land based learning or programs or other things that need to happen within the university i'm just wondering if you'd have any advice for us about trying to think that through and move that forward you know and i don't know if you have thoughts about that you're in the university yeah yeah yes i've been in a in a university for a long time now i think i've probably yeah, spent more time in a university than out of a university at this point. Um, but I do, I do see some changes happening that that are beneficial and are going in the right direction, in terms of like being an Indigenous faculty member, where I do feel I have the leeway to teach from an Indigenous pedagogy, mm -hmm. and to have that respected by the university, but to also have the students um, really hunger for it as well, no matter Indigenous students, non-Indigenous students, like to, to get out of the classroom, to learn from the land, to um, get outside, to learn from Indigenous knowledge keepers, um, from an Indigenous way of knowing, is beneficial to not only the Indigenous students in the university, but all the students I find benefit from um, learning from the, the knowledge keepers of the land that, we're, that we are learning from. And then in terms of just making space to bring in Indigenous ways of knowing, like I can say for, for my PhD program, like there did, there, I got to a point where I was actually going to quit. I got to a point where I'm like, oh, this isn't feeling right. This isn't what I want to learn about. We were talking way too much about um, the Indian Act and just all these colonial structures. And so then when I found out about the Indigenous research methodology um, and found out I was able to I could learn from my dreams, mm -hmm. I could learn from my ancestors and that there would be space in place um, for that. This was back before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, so it was a little bit more difficult. But I did have my um, supervisor, Dr. Ted Pallas, who, who really showed a tremendous amount of trust in me mm -hmm. in just letting me, like, just, just step back, let me do this, even though it wasn't gonna fit the, the standard way of collecting data and data analysis it was going to look very, very different. Um, and thankfully, there's professors like him and others now that will create that space and just like, yep, you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Because if we want to bring Indigenous ways of knowing into the university, it can't be but under our list of how it's going to happen, exactly. right? It has to be, this is how, what we need to do to make sure to respect those ways of being and knowing. So, I do see progress being made at the university, but I could be biased. I've, I've lived and raised in the university at this point. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I see progress. Uh, I'm going to check in with those of you in the room tonight and see if there are any questions and or if any comments or responses that you want to have. I could keep asking questions, but I just want to give a bit of a space for those of you who are here as well to see if there are any questions that people and we do have a microphone. Anybody have any questions or comments that you'd like to add at this time? Checking in. And if you have one more, you ask the question. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I will come back. Them. I do have questions online as well, though, uh, and I will maybe start with a few of those. And if you if you think of a question, just wave your hand, and uh, we'll uh, we'll get back to. Well, I'll come back to you. Um, so uh, this is from Moa. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. I was wondering how your work influences um, your thoughts on reconciliation. <laughs> uh, it's kind of picking up on that. Um, uh, and if there is even a point of continuing working and if there's even a, a point in continuing working with the federal government. Um, so yeah, just it, any ideas about that, about how governance and reconciliation Winona, you're smiling. Okay, yeah, I have so much to say about reconciliation. It's, um, I think the, the theory and the idea is in the right direction, but it's too soon. It, I feel like we, we stepped into reconciliation before we even knew what we're reconciling. Yeah. Like we have, we have Canadians that still don't even know the Canadian history, right? We have people learning about what um, Canadian history and thinking it's our history, that it's Indigenous history. 
um, when it's not. So to me, I think we jump to reconciliation almost so that, oh, so we don't have to deal with the tough stuff. Yeah. So we don't have to have those tough conversations. Let's just start reconciling. And to me, um, I'm, I'm a, I'm kind of have my heels in the ground with that one right now until I believe in decolonizing first. I'm an avid firm believer in decolonization. Uh, I know there's other scholars out there that, that are not, but for me, that's, let's do that first, then work towards reconciliation. Mm -hmm. I've got the feeling you might have something to say about that. <laughs> I'll start to be answering your last question, you know, about education. Mm -hmm. You know, um, my ex wife's from Tilela, and, we, and we, we had a choice to send our kids to a prestigious uh, private school or public school. And I said, okay, we'll try it. My son didn't like it. He's like, don't make me a robot, Dad. I don't want to be a robot. These kids are all robots. I want to be myself. And so, okay, I took him out. My, my daughter thrived in, with those kids that she's in school with. All of them graduated at 15. All of them went to university at 15. Wow. All of them, all of them took political science and business. They're saying, like, be rich and wealthy like your parents and run things like your parents. You look at our public school, and they'll say, if you're really smart, you could be a doctor or a lawyer. And there's a big difference. There's a, so, that, you know, from, from elementary school, we could be embedded in our belief on what we're capable of doing. And in our ceremonies, we say, I say, I'm, I'm failing if, if I'm not teaching you to surpass me. Mm. I'm failing if I don't give you the proper teachings to make sure you grab the tools that you need to do to improve your life, improve your community, improve your family, and you improve the world, then I'm failing. And, and that's what we instill. So in our education system, or your university, it's a dubious task to try to change people that's already embedded in them. Yeah. But it's not even embedded in them just, just for their lifetime, but the colonial system. Yeah. Of, of, of generations of thinking and being like that because you have generations of family doing the same job. You have generations of family being billionaires and millionaires. And, and so when, when you change and you look at your education system is how do you break that down? Well, what it comes down to me sometimes is, is what's your belief in spirit? And if you had belief in spirit, then you'd, you'd make better choices for your future generations because two people come together two spirits and they form a spirit of love and every single culture around the world honors that and they and they and they do ceremony in its marriage but but you know there's multiple like like you could improve your spirit and and have it in a relationship with your kids and family and and and, and our words like you're saying in your presentation and our land and our water and when you feel that it's undeniable so you want to make improvements so how could we do that in your education system mm. And then, and then, um, what was the second part? Her question again? The, the question. Oh, reconciliation. Here. Reconciliation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's it's hard uh, when when the the jail system hasn't changed. It's hard when I have a cousin here, did thirty years in jail for break and enter. A non-native won't, won't go to jail for killing a native. It's it's hard when. Um, I have people come into my ceremony that are mourning their, their murdered daughter that had missing fingers in, in that corner said it wasn't, wasn't suspicious. And it was two girls two weeks apart that were a block apart on Hastings and Heatley. Mm -hmm. And, they, and, the, and that's, that's, that's a travesty and that's not reconciliation. No. We have more kids in care now than we, we almost did in residential school. And, and that, that's not reconciliation. So, you know, we went to court and, and, and they said, you know what, your economic is, analysis is right. Slave with tooth, you're right. Canada, you're wrong. We won. Mm -hmm. But they said, no, but we're still going to side with the best interest of Canada. <laughs> yeah. you know, we win, we lose. And I walked out of there and said, I had a press conference. And the first thing I said is reconciliation died today, if it existed. <laughs> so, um, but you know what, though? My kids say something uh, that was profound to me and, and McLean's magazine did something about that. They said, Canada's more racist than the US. And I was like, oh, really? My kids said that. And then they did a story on that. And, 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 and they, they told me how, how it's subtle here. And down the States, you know, they say, yeah, you're Native American, but we're all Americans. 
But the thing is, up in Canada, there's more non-natives that are willing to go to bat for native cause than there is down there. And, and I think that's a beginning. You know, some of my ceremonies that are run half are, are um, non-First Nation. Mm. You know, and every nationality, all, you know, Chinese, African, everything. They all come and they want to learn and, and they really do go to bat. Um, Charlene and I, when we started the TMX fight, the elders said, before you work with an environmentalist, do ceremonies with them for six months. Mm -hmm. Us, the founders of Greenpeace and all these other organizations, and that's what we did. And we created a community, and, and most of the environmental people that we work with, they came. We invited, last meeting we had pre-COVID, we invited 90 organizations and 80 came. And most of them came to ceremony. Mm -hmm. And we showed them, you know, who we were, and the idea was, um, we show them ceremony, then they'll start to see and understand and know why our reciprocal relationship to the thing, the spirit that we love, which is the water and the land that has a, a reciprocal relationship is worth fighting for. And we show them that. So in one end, it's still disastrous where there isn't reconciliation, but the people are. Yeah. And we, we, we all have the friends. And, and here in Tsleil-Waututh too, there's a lot of really good people that help and, and believe in, in what we're doing. And, and I think that's a good thing. That's a really good thing. And I think we know who our allies are. And, and there's, there's, you know, at one point, we did a, a survey to Bernie B residents that were properly educated. And 71% of them supported to slay with the nation soon Canada from not consulting on the pipeline. And that was a huge thing. Yeah, that was a huge thing. Thank you. Thank you. I just have a couple of things. Um, um, It was, it was, um, I don't know how many generations back, great, 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 great grandfather, um, Chief Alexis from Chiam wrote a letter. Yeah, what are you like fourth grade? Um, I was reading a letter in one of our books that we have at home um, and him writing to the queen and asking for, um, that there was a few letters in there. There was about the land issue. There was about the fishing rights. Um, it was about our ceremonies, um, just pleading them to not abolish um, our potlatches and our, our longhouse um, ceremonies. Um, and the res some of the responses back, well, we'll reconcile um, the land issue or this and that. And it was always the the, the words that came back as well reconcile that. So I just kind of, you know, I didn't have a lot of, it, it's just the same reiteration just a thousand years later. Um, the same, you know, we'll reconcile, um, you know, before it was the Indian issue, before it was the fishing issue, before it was um, the land issue. And it's not very different these days of, you know, what it is that's in the hearts of leaders to, um try and reconcile with the with um i guess the crown um regarding our territories our land or our children um so i remember uncle len too saying one day it was um that the word reconcile or you know having this reconciliation with indigenous communities is is a red herring and yeah. so yeah we, we're beginning to see that because you know you could say sorry but if you keep doing the same behavior yeah. it's not an apology mm -hmm. it's just um, lip service and I think educating um, how can we clone Winona and yeah. <laughs> have, yeah. have more Winonas um, yeah. you know in in the systems where they're teaching the true history mm -hmm. of not only how to be um, in the territory of which you're in, but the true history yeah. and that that's that's really needed. And I remember it was my late aunt Lee Miracle telling me she was explaining uh, in detail um, to a class and um, we were at the speaking thing and she said, I, I explained a lot and I was like, well, you gave them the full the full end of the story. And she said, you know, he might be a leader down the road. He could be in charge of an organization or something. Yeah. So it's important for these young ones to have the correct history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see a hand up. 
Oh, good. There's a hand up in the room. Yes, please. <laughs> Hello. Um, Sim Giget, Sigurum Hanna Kabulse, Laura Lewis, Will, uh, Laura Lewis, um, Gingoich Will Whitgate, uh, Zat Maxwell Dugai, um, Chiefs, Matriarchs, and Honored Guests. My name is Laura Lewis. I come from the village of Kinkolith, but I live down here in Vancouver. Um, I just want to say thank you for allowing me to be here and allowing me to speak. Um, I think the biggest thing that like kind of stuck out for me regarding reconciliation was, um, and I appreciate the fact that like SFU is doing all these things, um, coming from an urban indigenous perspective, you know, we as indigenous people going into post-secondary, for example, trying to get higher education, um, the biggest factor is finance. Mm. Of course, like we get the support from our own communities and from our own bands, and they pay for that education to uplift our people. But where is that coming from, from the um, university and college standpoint? Mm -hmm. Where is that um, opening doors when meanwhile there's that financial gap, yeah. especially considering like not, not everybody's parent has a high income. So I think there's that bridge that needs to be um, discussed as well and um, just hearing these conversations happening in this room like it's really beautiful and honestly like try not to cry but it it's so nice having a panel of indigenous voices and like growing up in Vancouver for example sorry <clears throat> growing up in Vancouver for example like and being able to see this within my lifetime is beautiful. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, she got everybody. Even. Yeah, she got everybody. That was very moving. Thank you for <laughs> thank that comment. You. That was really beautiful. You know, um, and and I've taken note of that uh, support for Indigenous students in our uh, school system. So, thank you for that comment too. Uh, I am conscious we're coming to the end of our time, but there's a, a great question here I'd love to leave with um, and maybe uh, and this is from Bonnie and and it's really advice um, uh, to people like me. It's really as an uninvited guest on your territory. Uh, uh, Bonnie says I'm still inspired with indigenous ways of knowing being and living. Uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us and I want to be able to uh, to help you dismantle colonial structures. Mm -hmm. Um, as they're destroying the planet and our spirit. What's the best way for uninvited guests to support these efforts? What advice would you give? I think the first thing that comes real quickly is just knowing whose territory that you're yes. residing in. Yeah. Um, you know, when you think of uh, settlers, they think they're European, oh, they must be German or they're French or, you know, um, they're just all one um, race, um, which is not the case, yeah. and the same in Indigenous territories. Um, there's many tribes, um, and it's broken into um, language dialect. There's um, there's a, a huge population of dialects within BC alone. Yeah. So um, to know where you are at. That's great. Great advice. Mm -hmm. Other advice. Yeah, I would just, yeah, just add um, to that in terms of learning how to become a acclaimed ally. I know there's some like self-proclaimed allies out there that can actually cause a little bit of damage. Yeah. So to learn how to become acclaimed ally, and it does, it starts with learning about the territory that you're on. And then also perhaps learning a little bit about the language is always, is always helpful too. And I do appreciate how um, you let us bring in, even though I know you don't speak the language, and the effort that you put in to pronounce um, the Hunkaminam and the Halkamalam, I really appreciate that, and I think everyone could help yeah. do that. It's a language that I think everyone needs to pick up. It's, that's a personal opinion. Watch a whole bunch of old spaghetti western cowboy movies. <laughs> <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> Yeah, I don't Did know. you do that? <laughs> 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 oh dear. Really, any other advice? <laughs> Clint Eastwood movies. The Clint Eastwood movies. Well, you know, uh, 
you do have to be able to laugh a little bit though too, oh, right? Yeah. And, uh, and recognize the humor in things. Um, this has just been an incredible evening for me. I feel, oh, another question. Chris, oh, yeah. okay, oh, okay, I'll give you the last question, Chris. Oh, it's gonna be the toughest one. Hot Yeah. Hot uh, Hatsquail. First of all, just uh, want to thank our relatives from Slavitov for having me here and having us here tonight and hosting us in your beautiful house. I recognize that you guys are sitting in the House of Governance as well, mm -hmm. and the council chambers, and uh, <laughs> it's just great to be here as always, and uh, honored to be here and thankful to say a few words and. Just want to, I guess my question to the panel and into Dr. Hall is as we, as I was looking at your presentation, there was nothing in your presentation about the Indian Act. And you mentioned that you said the, the close, the closer you got to colonial systems, the further you wanted to go the other way. And, and when I think about our governance systems, and what's working in our communities to deal with the trauma and the pain is our our old ways, our traditional governance and our um, our laws. Everybody understands when they go to ceremony what their role and responsibility is. Everybody has a role when you go into the big house or you go into a naming. And regardless if you're a young child or an elder, you kind of know what's what perplexes me um, and what challenges me as a Indigenous person, a Squamish descent, is how do we take that beautiful governance and teaching that we see every day in our ceremonies and in our big houses and apply it to everyday governance in our community. Mm -hmm. So I, I'll, I'll use an example where um, and Winona talked, you talked about it, our elders used to, our, our leaders used to sit with one another and sit with the community and say, what's going on? What's wrong? What's working? Um, sometimes we don't do that because we still operate under the Indian Act system. Mm -hmm. And the Indian Act has taught our people, if you have a problem, you go talk to your counselors, you talk to your administration and you get mad at them and don't get mad at us. So I think about those those teachings those governance teachings that we see in our ceremonies and our, on our land and our laws when we're hunting and we're fishing and when we're protecting our places and i wonder how do we how do we move those into our everyday lives as indigenous people um so it's not just in the longhouse so it's not just in a ceremony it's every day and i think our people struggle with that with the pain and suffering yeah. Because um, our old people used to say everyone in the community at any given day had a role. So how do we how do we move to that spot and almost leave the colonial system outside and just focus on those richness and those things that our ancestors protected? So I'd love your your ideas of how we kind of do that in a modern context. Thank you. I actually I hear a lot of answer in your question, Chris, in terms of like how we're behaving and how we conduct ourselves in ceremony for us to remember to conduct ourselves like that no matter where we are. Mm -hmm. I think that's just the, the best advice you could ever give to people. I think part of what we're dealing with might be a little bit of the old, the remnants of the anti-potlatch laws. There's still, mm -hmm. we still have people amongst us who remember when it was illegal. And so having to go hide and do it over here and but not do it over here. So I think there might be some remnants of that that we're contending with, but certainly not in our generation and the next um, generations. But of course, we're very connected intergenerationally. So that intergenerational trauma, the intergen, even though I may never have gone to jail for something, doesn't mean that I don't feel it in my memory and in my my cell memory mm -hmm. um, of that. So I think just being a little bit patient, and and things yeah. like like tonight, like things like doing this is just amazing. And I'm just. I can't, I want to express the, like how many ancestors are here with us tonight. Mm -hmm. I, I, I almost wanted to cry. I'm like, look at all those empty chairs. Look at all our ancestors with us. Mm -hmm. Cause that's the way it's meant, meant to be, right? Creating space for that. Not just in the longhouses where we can 
create space for our ancestors. Everywhere we go, we should have space for them. So yeah, I just think I'm just reiterating what you also said, because it speaks to me. <laughs> Just lovely. Sorry, did I? I just had a thought when you were speaking about that is um, um, when we do ceremony and that's how we conduct ourselves. A lot of the time, a lot of Indigenous communities, um, their natural resources have been scraped of the land. And, you know, you're in ceremony, but then you're in an unhealthy setting of the land. Mm -hmm. So starting to heal the land will heal heal your people. Um, and I think that was one of the basis of where we did start our opposition to what is happening with the industry within our inlet is um, one of the ladies came down, Melina Massimo Lubacan, and she said um, it was hard for her to even go out on the land to do ceremony. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, where there was um, bushes and trees to go do bathing or ceremony or anything was just all barren. And so how do you make yourself healthy as an Indigenous person knowing that um, the land that you're living on is, is sick? So it is, it is um, you know, the trajectory of our, of our lives of the period that we went through with the residential schools, the 60s scoop, um, the murdered and missing Indigenous women, and how how sick our people got. Um, you know, we're healing along with the land. Now the land has just put the, her foot down and said, "Enough is enough." Mm -hmm. You know, I can't take this inundation of um, capitalism, industry, and you know, consistently taking of the land. Um, it's time to put our foot down and and save her and start to heal those spaces where we get our medicine from, where our songs came from, where our language comes from, where our good medicine, our Aich Gwalawans. How do you lift your spirit up in order to walk? Because yes, we do, it's fitting that we're here, one foot in our laws and then one foot moving forward, or you know, one foot um, with our ancestors and that spirit of that Snow Waya and one foot and how to how to bring it to places where culture doesn't even live. Mm -hmm. And it is making that space for it is important. I think uh, <laughs> the world that we live in is pretty dysfunctional. It, you know, like to allow things happen the way they're happening. Sometimes I think of talking about our ancestors or great grandpa, like explaining even to my grandpa what an atmospheric river is or, <laughs> or explaining there's 200 or sorry, over 300 fires in British Columbia at once. Explaining that the salmon might die in some of the rivers or explaining what fentanyl is and how many people it's killing. And, and you know, I could, I could just imagine the puzzlement that they'd have, but not just my grandpa, everybody's here. Every single one of us think of it to explain it to that. So we're hurting. What we are is, is we're hurting because we, you know, we wouldn't want that for our kids. You know, I, I really want to be grandpa. <laughs> I do. All my siblings are grandparents except me. I just, my, my poor kids, I tease them. I want to be grandpa. But um, I, I wonder what kind of world they inherit. And the trajectory we're going is pretty bad. But then where does it come from? You know, you look at our, our indigenous communities, you know, of anxiety and depression. You know, I, I never went through, my mom went through, my grandpa went through, but I got that. And what you said, we inherited that. And or even experienced some, some, some trauma ourselves. It could even be when we're young. But every year after that trauma, something could be born out of that trauma that also carries the spirit. Two people could come together and form a spirit of love. They could form a, two people come together and form a spirit of trauma. Yeah. And, and, and if that trauma happened when you're little, every year of your life, you could accumulate something new that, that's related and came from that trauma. 
anxiety, depression, anger, hate, alcoholism, drug addiction. But some of that's our own. But what happens is it's a communal trauma. It's all there in one place, a communal trauma, and we need to heal that. But also it's related to our inherent trauma. But that's just our story. Mm -hmm. Look at the where the world started today as, you know, I was talking to my friend Seth Klein yesterday, and, and he was he was talking about how things were structured from World War II, or how 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 the monetary system that United States said we'll join the war if we 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 print the money and we, we set the standard with our dollar. It was a monetary system, and that we're all part of it, and the decisions that the government makes influencing the elementary schools and everything else, and and creating it to what it is today is, is pretty dysfunctional. But it's intergenerational trauma, even before that time, that created the state of where we are today. So for us, for us, it is happening. Me and our family, nobody drinks from my mom down. Mm. I don't think it's one or two maybe. I know we had a Christmas party and one of those, there's like 40 of us, 45 of us. And, and, but that healing started, and it was intergenerational. I mean, I mean sure, our sisters, because our, our moms are sisters, and we're brother and sister, I'm not a sister. <laughs> <laughs> that $5 too. But, but they're, we're, we're raised like that, and, and, but what we did is, we did a communal ceremony to deal with a communal trauma mm -hmm. with your mom, my mom, your daughter, my kids, and, and we started reversing that. So even a spirit could be born negative, a trauma, like love is a spirit, trauma could be a spirit, but we could change that and turn it to something good. That's wisdom, that's courage, that's compassion. It could change to something. And I, I think that's what we need. And that's what we are doing in my family and, and we'll help anybody who wants to. Anybody comes to ceremonies, walk through those doors and We'll help them, no matter who they are, native, non-native, we'll help them because our society needs healing. And that's just an example of our family, but where we could go as a community, you know, we, we, we Uncle Len had a vision for, with our, our aunts and uncles, for us to do healing. And he had a vision for economic sovereignty to, to supplement that healing. Every one of our departments are, are, are funded by our economic development and, and, and language is so important. Our culture is so important. Education is so important. Healing is so important. Geez, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad for a long time we only had two therapists. I think we have eight now. Yeah. And I'm so happy for that. You know, I'm going to go see one too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, and why not? And, um, but I think that's what we need. And that's what we need to continue to do. And then from that, because what I said in the beginning, those fundamentals of humanity is how we're supposed to raise our kids. Love, honor, and respect, dignity, all those things that I said. If you didn't get that, what did you get? But once we get healing again and we heal to a point, you're at the point of what you were when you're born, born with no prejudice, no anger, no hate, no trauma. Then we start to build you up from there. And this generation now, when the kids come in, we should build them up from there continuously. And if there's things and wounds that that we need to heal, we'll, we'll do that communally too. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, we are coming to the close of our time together and um, uh, I, I know there are many more questions. I've got to say there's a whole list of questions online and um, I, I will say in particular, Ruben, people really want to know about where we're at with the pipeline, but I'll save that. We'll, we'll come back and have another discussion about that at another time. <laughs> Um, but I want to say, um, Charlene, um, you know, Ruben, um, and, and Winona, thank you for this conversation. Uh, and Winona, um, I want to thank you in particular uh, for saying no to the president's faculty lecture initially and saying I won't do it if I can't do it in community. Um, because this has been very, very special for me and I think for all of us to be here and to have this conversation here. Uh, so thank you for that. That really... Um, means a lot to me and and you know there are a lot of learnings from tonight that I'm going to take home and, and and really think about in terms of my leadership and and my responsibilities as a university president 
Um, but I'm hopeful um, that there are ways that we can continue uh, to create this, this and grow our connection in particular with the Suela Tith Nation. Um, so I do want to say a few thank yous. I want to say thank you uh, to our counselors who are here this evening, the leadership of the nation, uh, the relationship, as I said, with um, SFU really means a lot and we are moving from strength to strength and we will continue that work. Um, I, I really also um, want to say thank you to the team at the back of the room tonight, um, uh, Miles and the Gold Corp Center group at the back for um, helping us do our thing. Thank you ever so much. And of course, yes, please, Dream thank team. you. Dream team. Dream team. And of course, Public Square to Janet, Seth, Gabby, Silvana, Gabriel, Sophia, and Athena, and the wonderful volunteers. It does take a village to put a public square together, and I do deeply appreciate everything that you've done. Um, this has really been very inspiring to me and um, uh, and I think to our whole community. We had a lot of people online tonight and it just shows the incredible interest that people have in this topic. Um, we're going to have another um, uh, President's Faculty Lecture uh, on April 30th. I encourage you we're, um, to join us for that. And Woden Nosek, he's a professor at St. Paul's Hospital uh, in the area of HIV AIDS research is going to be doing a presentation and I think we'll be back on our campus but encourage any of you who want to participate to participate online or or join us there as well um, I think there's food in the corner for those of you who are in the room I encourage you to stick around I know some of you do have questions as well and we can continue the conversation um, but for those of you online who cannot join the reception and those of us here, I want to say good night and thank you very, very much for joining us and thank you everyone here for joining us as well and your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you ever so much.